Um, so I, I have the pleasure today to introduce Ming Wang, who is an assistant professor at University of California, Riverside. So he's coming from, coming and joining us from the West Coast of the United States. So he got up early, much earlier than Ming typically gets up, I would say. Um, so he could be here today. Um, we've been using a lot of the tools that Ming has developed extensively in this workshop. So you've heard of GPS multiple times, use it. Um, so Ming gets all the credit and also a little bit of the blame for any of the things that are maybe less than perfect. Um, but Ming is very responsive, very engaged in the community. Um, and I'm really excited to see what he has to talk about today. So with that, Ming, take it away. Thank you, Alan. And, you know, Thanks everybody for you know stopping by the the summer school. Hopefully you're enjoying it. I didn't realize it was going to be such a, a star-studded staff, so I'm a I'm a little bit jealous that I couldn't be there in person. Um, so anyway, thank you for the organizers for having me, um, and thank you all for you know, just being you know being here and you know giving giving sharing your time with with me. Um, as Alan said, I'm uh, a new faculty at uh, UC Riverside. Uh, here in Southern California. We just got past the hurricane, so everything's good. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna I'm excited to tell you about a little bit of some new tools, um, some things that I'm just optimistic about uh, coming out of my lab and collaborators for the future. And as Alan mentioned, um, you know, a lot of the tools uh, you know, I helped work on over the years, and I deserve the blame, but really it's been a community effort with about uh, almost everybody see in front of you at the table and a lot of people in the audience as well. Um, it's really been an amazing journey to, to build these tools, find out what people need and just make it work um, all together over the years. So I'm eternally grateful for all the friends and collaborators over the last you know decade and a half of, of doing all this. But without further ado, I, I want to get started with some things I want to share with you, you all. My talk is called uh, Community Scale Tools for Metabolomics Analysis. Um, and you guys are going to be experts after the summer school. No, no thanks to me, but thanks to everybody else. But just to share some new ideas um, and new uh, new tools with you all that we've been working on. So um, here are my disclosures. Um, and one of the things behind, you know, the kind of a high level thought process of GMPS is it's a combination of multiple things, right? So we have tools that and algorithms, visualizations that you all interacted with, that we have it, that we had, that you, you played with to analyze some data. But in conjunction with that, we also have uh, a data repository at GMPS um, that includes you know, published data uh, and resources from the community. And so to date, it's a little over 50, 60 terabytes of raw metabolomics data. Um, and about a billion tandem mass spectrum. So a decent size, something you don't wanna be really downloading on your own personal computer, you know, that frequently. Um, but then at the other end, we also have uh, knowledge bases, which is community aggregated data where, uh, you know, anybody can contribute to and then everybody can leverage. So examples of this are spectral libraries, um, which have MSMS and the structure, so you can re-identify known compounds and see what other people have identified in their data. So it's these three things working in concert uh, that we think really makes things a lot more valuable. Um, and those are all accessible via the web um, at uh, GMPS. And so just giving a historic bent to this, we started this whole endeavor about 2013. I remember uh, I was a grad student at the time and Christmas break was amazing for productivity. I was didn't go home. I just stayed in the lab. Don't, don't encourage this awful work-life balance, but that's what I did. Um, and then we launched uh, GMPS early in 2014, and it's grown from there. And so just as a kind of a recap, over the last seven, eight, nine years, um, we have this chart here showing the number of jobs that we run every month. So bottom line, it's growing. Um, we've the community has come and analyzed over 600,000 jobs. It totals about 25 million um, LCMS runs. So, you know, it's, a, it's something. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very excited about that. So we've had a pretty good, pretty good run. Um, but what, and so 
you know, GMPS is one thing that I've been very excited about. Another thing that I've been excited about very recently, I just want to share with you all, is the arrival of my 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 first son, um, or my son. We'll see if there's a second. Um, but and it's been amazing. This has happened in July. But one of the things that I realized, uh, maybe it's maybe it's obvious, but I'm a I'm a computer guy, and you know I, I, I you know their computers are more predictable. Is that there's no off button with a baby. When he starts crying, they keep crying, and you can't just you can't just ignore them. So which has been amazing, um, as as a parent. But the one thing that has uh, caused some issues. Uh, is that whenever there's a there's a server problem or uh, you know some fault or some software bug, for example, with GMPS, I'm a little preoccupied. So, um, and we don't have a particularly big staff in doing maintenance um, and, and upkeep. And so, what we've noticed, especially during July, right as my son was born, is that there were a few issues, you know, a few bugs that caused about a nine percent downtime over over in July. And so that's about three days um, where the servers were down. Um, and so not great. Uh, I got dozens of emails and then it, it, it disrupts a resource that people rely on for their work. So I feel pretty bad about, about something like this. So this made it evident that there's a clear need for resiliency. And you kind of notice it. And I got a text from Danny at like 1 a.m. here saying, hey, we th I think we killed it. So you you guys all got a little taste of when a centralized resource goes down, it's, you know, it's not great. Um, uh, it's hard to proceed. Um, and so currently GMPS is all, and all these pieces of GMPS are housed at UC San Diego. And so I did my PhD and postdoc work there um, and with working with Nuno Bandera and Peter Dorostein. Um, but it's, you know, a single point of failure for the community, and it's not great. There's other downsides to it, but it's also just not, it's not great in case there's maintenance, people can't get their work done. And so we try our best to have uptime and availability, but we are not, you know, uh, Amazon, Google, or Microsoft. So one of the things that we've launched at UC Riverside is something called, that we creatively call GMPS2. So with a lot of the big data, it's gonna stay at UCSD. A lot of the knowledge bases are gonna stay at UCSD, but a lot of the tools um, will be re-hosted and kind of remixed in GMPS2 at UC Riverside. And so that what does this buy us, right? Um, at the end of the day, what's kind of our overarching philosophy for this is number one, as, as I've alluded to, is resiliency. So if you have a problem, with if we have a problem at UCSD or going undergoing maintenance, we are able to redeploy all the tools, web accessible for anybody to use uh, on commodity hardware at any institution. So we'll have we'll have backups. That's great. Um, number two, uh, and these are kind of indifference from GMPS one that we really didn't like, is that it allows us to have flexibility. Um, because it can only run at UCSD, it can only run literally on a single com computational cluster at UCSD. It was just a nightmare to do any sort of development or if anybody wanted to run their run the tools on their own computer, on their own data, whenever our servers were not enough, it just was not possible. And so we want these workflows to run anywhere, not just at UC Riverside servers, but anybody who has a Linux-ish machine should be able to do this. And so this allows us to also make workflow development for GMPS2 significantly easier. And so just as an FYI, you don't need a privilege, you don't need to be an employee of UCSD in order to do this um, anymore. Um, it, it enables, if, we hope that it facilitates more shareability. And so we can access public data from not just UCSD resources, but from any public uh, mass spec repository from anywhere in the world from metabolomics, proteomics, glycomics, things, things like that. And also, if we have multiple uh, versions of GMPS2 running, we can easily push results from one server to the other and share, share it amongst the community, again, for more uh, resiliency. And kind of the, the, the final point is privacy. And so one of the things that you all are kind of 
to institute that you guys are are at right now is is a serum from from real people, right? Babies, and uh, that cannot predominantly that cannot leave that raw data cannot leave that particular institution. It's 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 private. So uploading it to um, a resource that you do not control probably not the best idea, and is probably a violation of um, your you know, privacy mandates. Um, so with GMPS2, we hope that you know institutions that want to use the tools that we develop, they can use it by deploying it internally, and they can maintain privacy of their data. So that's kind of one of the uh, advances that that we have here. And so those again, those are the kind of the the key things to be gained from this new platform. Um, so GMPS2 at UCR UCR is live today. It's in a beta. So if you'd like to try it, reach out. Um, we can you know make you an account again. We are we have very modest resources in a new lab, uh, my new lab there, but happy to share with the community. Um, in that respect. And you know, kind of looking forward in the middle to near term is we're hoping to bring online um, other instances of GMPS two around the world, some in Europe, some in South America. There's a, these are kind of uh, a biggest users of GMPS. So we'll see we we'll see how that goes. Um, and so then. If I'm asleep, there will be some instance that's you know running around the world. You don't have if something breaks, you don't have to rely um, on me. So um, that's both freeing and and kind of exciting for me. But okay, so that's enough about uh, you know kind of the infrastructure kind of components and kind of democratizing these tools um, out into the world. Um, I just wanted to mention a few you know talk a little bit about a few tools um, that we've been working on in GMPS2 that specifically involve big data. I think that it's a pretty exciting uh, aspect of our work. And how can we start taking advantage um, of all this data that you know only recently people started depositing? And just giving you a point of reference about you know when I was starting my PhD, there was almost no public uh, small molecule mass spectrometry data available. People just didn't release it. And now that, you know, we're making the resource, making utility from the resources and the culture is changing within the community. We have thousands and thousands of public data sets uh, available and you know, at least dozens to hundreds being released every month across all the public repositories. So it's definitely very exciting times. And you can see kind of this accelerating growth, um, at least at, used the, at GMPS over, over the past couple of years. So pretty exciting. Um, but at this kind of scale, what the heck are we supposed to do with it, right? So again, 60 terabytes is not huge, but for us, for somebody to download it and work with it and kind of extract some meaning, it's not the most straightforward thing to do. And so just to create an analogy for uh, what other people expect in, in, in adjacent fields, within the sequencing community, it is expected that you're able to easily go to NCBI, look at all the deposited genomes and sequences and ask the question, hey, where else has somebody seen this particular DNA sequence ever? Whether it's across published finished genomes or even in the short read archive of, of raw reads, right? This is a, this is a question that, um, that people take for granted within that particular area of bioinformatics. And so we kind of asked the question, you know, why can't we do this for mass spectrometry? If you that we can do a similar thing and it's a very natural and we hope that it's a very useful question to be able to answer. And so one of the tools that we created is called the mass or the mass spectrometry tool. So mass for short, kind of a clever acronym or kind of a kind of clever name there. And in the same way with BLAST, where you can take a DNA sequence and search it across all NCBI. Um, going to some server and, and, and do this procedure, we want to be able to enable the same thing for tandem mass spectrometry with mass. And so it, the analogy here is that instead of looking for a sequence, our kind of fingerprint or barcode that we're actually looking for is the whole tandem mass spectrum. Um, and then what we can do is we can go to all the data sets and all the data that's ever been published before. We do some clever indexing uh, on this data and pre-processing so that we can start doing the comparison and answer the question, in what context, in what data sets, in what kind of metadata have we ever seen uh, the molecule that, that you're looking for? Right? And so as, as you guys have seen, um, 
you, when you run these untargeted metabolomics experiments, you end up with thousands to tens of, tens of thousands, and depending on the scale, maybe hundreds of thousands of analytes in your data. The vast majority of them are unidentified to, to known structures. So you probably want to uh, get a little bit more context um, before you get the structure out, right? So where else has it occurred? In what kinds of systems does it occur? And you know what kinds of experimental conditions or diseases and, and things like that um, does it occur? And just so walking you through one particular example, when we published this original work a few years ago, um, there was one particular tandem mass spectrum that we studied in a human data set. It happened to be human stool. We didn't know what the actual molecule was at the time, but what we did know was that it was um, overexpressed in patients that had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as, a, as compared to um, healthy patients. So this is something we detected in the stool. But again, we didn't know what the structure was. And we kind of said, well, this is kind of interesting, right? This is a kind of an interesting finding that it's um, upregulated or higher abundance, um, relative abundance in a non-alcoholic fatty liver. So, but we we're like, well, you know, could it be some sort of artifact in our particular analysis? Could we find another context and other studies where the same molecule was being, which we observed, that would give us a little bit more information and corroboration of our finding. We did, but took the MSMS for that particular molecule, again, that we didn't, didn't know. We used mass to search all public data. And what we observed was that the same analyte was found in 43 uh, other data sets, right? So a decent amount uh, that was found elsewhere, and we were able to kind of confirmed that to, to at least, you know, a first approximation, it was the same or very similar analyte um, that we can see here on this, this mirror plot. And so that's fine. 43 is quite a lot. As we're digging through these 43 data sets, we found some that had detailed experimental data. They told us, hey, the, for example, there was a mouse study that half of the samples were from uh, mice that were fed uh, a normal diet, so expressed here is NC, and then another half was fed a high fat diet. So not great for the you know the liver health, but um, but for the same exact metabolite, we went back in um, that we found with mass, and we looked at the relative abundances. And one of the things that we observed was that this same metabolite was observed in the stool of the mice and was higher uh, in the high fat diet versus the normal food. So this gave us a little bit more confidence uh, that this particular uh, uh, molecule that you know, we, we didn't know um, seemed to co be corroborated by another mouse study uh, and kind of similar, you know, not the same experimental setup, but kind of a, a reasonably analogous experimental setup. So we think it's something involving with the liver, involved with the liver. So that gave us a little more confidence in our particular hypothesis. Um, and then uh, some collaborators actually was done with Peter's group did the uh, discovery work um, and they solved the structure um, and they hypothesized that it was actually being synthesized by the microbiome in the, in the gut. And uh, it has some implications on, you know, the liver health. So it was a bile acid was, was involved in that in that direction. But the story, the, the bottom line is we started with a hypothesis in our own data, and we were able to gain a little bit more context and corroboration um, even before we could identify what the molecule was by leveraging all this public data that was available. Um, so again, this won't be perfect for all situations uh, because there's differences in how people run mass spectrometers. You might not find the same molecule in others if you're tuning your mass spectrometer in a in a unique way. Um, but if you know we're all getting to a place where our tandem mass spectra are tuned reasonably similarly, this this might be uh, uh, an avenue to, to kind of explore. Um, okay, so. Uh, we're able, you know, that's one example. There's, you know, there's hundreds of examples now of people applying this tech, uh, this using this tool. Um, but the most basic uh, intrinsic operation that we have to do in order for mass to work is we have a single tandem mass spectrum, for example, here on the left, and we have all these, you know, over a billion 
public tandem mass spectra here on the right. And so again, the most basic operation is we do a spectrum similarity, like a cosine similarity between our unknown spectrum versus all public mass spectrometry data on the right. And so we do this one at a time. And so in this ex previous example we showed you, you know, this is kind of the first time, one of the first times that we enabled this. So there was no other way to do it, but it was, and people were happy to wait, you know, uh, tens of minutes to match a single spectrum against all this public data. Uh, horrendously unacceptable. Um, just to give you an example, kind of in our first iteration of MAST, it would take us a, to query a single MSMS spectrum 15 minutes. Not great. Now you can imagine if you have 10,000 features where you want to ask this sort of question, where and when has it been seen before? If you're going to wait 15 minutes per molecule, you're going to be waiting a couple of years to finish the query for your data set. So not particularly scalable from, from that aspect. And so, you know, this is kind of a, an ongoing project and uh, one of the papers just came out recently, but mass is slow and how can we make it uh, really fast? We won't go through the details, but uh, the specific details, but the basic high level idea is whenever you have your tandem mass spectrum, they have this property of sparsity. So you don't have masses at every single, you don't have peaks at every single mass, right? Most of the time, like your spectra is 99% empty. And so in our kind of slow way, we look at every single mass and we, we do the comparison and we look at every single mass in, uh, in all the public data. But if we recognize that we are querying with spectra that have mostly zeros for masses, we can exploit the sparsity. And so what this allows us to essentially do is ignore 99% of the data in our public data sets, which is great. So if we can ignore 99% of the data that allows us to do the comparisons, but it allows us to do it, you know, orders of magnitude faster. So this is a paper that we just published recently. Um, it's called Blink um, in collaboration with uh, Ben Nuno and uh, Ben Pullman. And we were able to increase the speed um, of our naive implementation about by 3,000 fold. So reasonable. Um, and so we're able to transform something that took 15 minutes to something that takes now milliseconds. Um, and so this really helps us scale whenever we want to repeat this particular procedure uh, over your, own, your whole data set. And so this is available today. Um, if you go to GMPS2, there's a little link to do MAST. Um, and clever, you know, there's a, we cleverly call it FAST. Anyway, we thought it was funny. Um, but definitely give it a try and let us know what you think. But again, this is kind of an ongoing thing um, that, that we're really trying to optimize. And it's definitely not perfect, but uh, we hope that it moves the needle for everybody. Um, and it's a much better workshop experience whenever it's um, near instant as opposed to clicking go and waiting 15 minutes. Um, for everybody in the room. Okay, so at, with mass, we were able, kind of in conclusion, we were able to take an entire tandem mass spectrum and ask, have we seen that that same molecule in its entirety in all the public data? So once we created that, when I, we were working with Peter, um, he was, it's so it's kind of a, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, uh, if you give a mouse a cookie, he'll want a glass of milk. So basically you give him something and they want, everybody wants more, which is great. It you know, kind of pushes us um, to, to be innovative. But one of the things that Peter, you know, kind of, kind of flippantly asked, you know, in, in a kind of excited way is, you know, now we can search all of these, uh, like these full molecules, but what if we wanted to look for specific classes of compounds or even more, you know, more broadly, uh, uh, you know, specific patterns in the data. And so Peter, one question he asked is, can we find all carnitines in public data sets, right? We have all this data out there and they have tandem mass spectrum. Maybe we, could we just, how can we find all carnitines, right? And so I'm a computer scientist. One of the things that I, we can do is like, okay, I know something about carnitines. We know some specific rules about their fragmentation, specific 
masses and neutral losses in the tandem mass spectrum, we can write up a simple script that encodes specifically that, you know, try to search all public mass spectrometry data and say, great, here they are, we're done. Unfortunately, um, uh, or fortunately for us, again, uh, so this is specific structural features of molecules uh, yield specific and conserved patterns. So some of these include isotopic patterns, some of them are uh, MS2 peaks and uh, MS2 losses in the combination of all these things. But the bottom line is whenever we could enable this once, the analytical chemists that we were working with, they were like, oh, great, okay, so how about let's change what we're looking for to different classes of compounds or being even more specific about uh, a particular class that they want to look for, so a particular type of compound or natural product that they want to start finding in the data. And so it, it quickly became uh, a very uh, intensive back and forth. Let's change this about the what we want pattern that we want to look for. Um, and as a computer person, I don't like to do any work. Um, so we wanted to be able to create a universal kind of kind of uh, raises the question: Can we develop a universal computational solution to help chemists answer these questions so that I can sit back and not do anything? That's that's the dream, right? Um, instead of me writing any code for for the you know for the community and collaborators, can I build a framework so they can express what they want to find themselves? And so we think the answer is yes. So one of the tools that we've been building um, and it's available for use today, if you want to try it out, is called the Mass Spec Query Language, um, and MassQL for short. And so there's several pillars that that we want to build on for this particular tool. The first is that it's understandable. So for a lot of you all, it needs to be easy to read and write um, for chemists. You probably, a lot of you don't want to write big, you know, uh, big tools like in Python or whatever um, that take a lot of time and debug. We want it to be simple and succinct. It needs to be flexible. So it needs to be able to express all the patterns that you would want to actually search for and mass spec adjacent uh, things that you might want to filter on, such as retention time and ion mobility. Um, also want it to be scalable, right? So if it searches one file, it's not super useful, um, but we want to be able to scale this to all public data sets. And if we can enable that, then if you want to search all the data that you personally have ever collected in your own lab, that's kind of a piece of cake if we can search everything that the entire the whole community has deposited. Um, and finally, we want it to be reusable, right? So we don't want these one-off scripts that are kind of dead ends. You, if, if, sometime, if you spend the time to figure out what you want to look for, you can share that with other collaborators within your own lab, um, with your students, um, postdocs, um, but also share it with the rest of the community so they can benefit from the knowledge that you put in to this particular query. So those are kind of the four pillars. And so we're just going to go through a few of these and see how they manifest in the creation of the language. So first, to be understandable, uh, we created these translation layers. Um, where you can, at the top is MassQL, and we translate to other languages, so it's a little bit more natural, especially when, during the learning phases. So here, for example, we want to find all MS2 data where there's an MS2 product P468, so we can see the uh, the translation along with it. Um, and if we want to start adding other conditions, maybe we want to have 468 and 660 M over Z uh, within, you know, within this. Um, and I didn't I actually didn't include this in the slides. So we show this going from MassQL into English. Uh, and, you know, again, it helps you learn from examples. But one of the very cool things that has come up over the past couple months, I'm sure you've all heard of it, is, is things like ChatGPT and these large language models really becoming pervasive. What's been really fun is that now you can write something in natural language and ask it to translate back into MassQL, and it can do it. And it's very impressive. Um, it is hilariously impressive. Uh, but anyway, that's if you don't want to learn MassQL, you can just write it in English and then it'll write it for you. Um, so that's kind of a, a side point. Uh, and it, again, so that's being understandable. Um, flexibility in terms of describing mass spec patterns. So these are, um, here are a few examples of certain things you can query for. It's not exhaustive, but on the top left here, if you want to look for MS2 spectra or MS1 spectra with specific peaks, you can express that. Um, to the top right, you can say losses from precursor. 
that there's a particular term for that MF2 NL, you can start looking for gaps between peaks. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to know what the peaks are, you just know that there's a there's a neutral loss between them um, that is not, and they don't have to be the precursor, as well as enforcing uh, peak relative peak intensities between a subset of the peaks that you're interested in. And so the idea, the nice part about this is you can mix and match any of these conditions that you actually uh, want to search for. So if you want to look for a product ion and a neutral loss from precursor, you can combine those two things um, with, with these uh, conjunctions. So just walking through one particular example, you, you've met Danny. Um, and so this is some, some work that he had published, I, I believe probably in his PhD, some of his PhD work. He was looking for working with some natural product compounds. Um, in this particular case, um, a family called albicidins. And so he knew that albicidins yielded distinctive fragmentation at 468 and 660 mOrizi. So that's something he knew about this family of natural products. And so he could easily write a MassQL query and find uh, a family of molecules within his own data. Something that he had predominantly done manually by flipping through hundreds of thousands of tandem mass spectrum, which just kills me as a computer person. And so he was able to do this. And we created MassQL after he published his paper from 2017, but we looked back at the data and we were able with MassQL very easily to find all the known compounds that he had orig originally published on kind of in a few minutes. So that's, you know, pretty exciting um, to be able to, that's our positive control to be able to, to do that. But what was a little bit more exciting is we were able to throw, apply MassQL and visualize here with a molecular network and it highlighted in blue here, are the known albicidin analogs that Daniel had published back in 2017. But what we also revealed within this molecular network are in gray, which we think are putative new analogs of albicidin that Danny did, did not publish on. But we were able to very quickly in a few minutes kind of organize, extract them out and organize them and create a hypothesis to say, okay, here are some new analogs. If you wanted to actually continue this work and discover more anal structural analogs, here they are. Um, this is an area for prioritization and discovery that save, that leverages his domain knowledge of this particular compound class and allows for discovery relatively quickly. So we thought that was, that's one uh, use case of this particular tool. And so the next, the next point here is about uh, scalability. And so we wanna, you know, really, really roll this up again, just like mass, we want to be able to scale this up to all public data um, that's out there and see if we can make use of it. And so one particular uh, application that we'll highlight here is working with Nina Zhao, who's a postdoc at UCSD. And so she cares a lot about environmental chemistry. And so what she was looking for during her PhD, and, and her PhD work was a uh, class of compounds called organophosphate esters. And so just a broad kind of, uh, overview of why they matter. They're used in flame retardants and there's a large diversity. So there's, hundred, there's hundreds of known analogs of organophosphate esters um, and they're not particularly good for our health, human health, and they end up in um, our waterways. So it's it's good to at least understand how much diversity there is of these molecules um, and how big of a problem um, it potentially could be. Um, and so what Nina knew about this particular compound um, class of compounds, they generated a distinctive fragmentation at 98 mOrizi. Z. So she knew that. And so she was able to write very easily, again, it's not particularly complicated, is a query that looked for uh, MS2 spectra with this particular uh, fragment, and it had to have been a very high intensity. So that's, that's something she knew uh, about the fragmentation. And so what we were able to do, because we built out this whole ecosystem and infrastructure for MassQL, is throw in all public data from GMPS, metabolome, workbench, and metabolites, and, uh, and search these 1.1 billion spectra. To manually go through all this, not the most fun thing to do. Um, but with MassQL, we were able to filter out this 1.1 billion down to about 330,000 uh, MSMS spectra. That's still quite a large amount that exhibit this particular pattern. Um, and so there's a lot of repetition. And so what we did was we collapsed identical and merged identical MSMS spectra to reduce the redundancy. So this yielded about a little under 3000 unique uh, tandem mass spectra and we visualized them 
by with into families of similar fragmentation with molecular networking, something you all have learned a little bit about. And so this reduced the complexity uh, even further by another order of magnitude. And we were able to start, Nina was able to start exploring uh, this data that she was not able to explore previously, just because we couldn't create molecular networks of all public uh, mass spec data before. And so what she was able to glean from uh, the results from MassQL is that known organophosphate esters could explain about under 10% of the masses that, that we found here. Uh, but as she was coming through, she was able to discover new organophosphate esters that hadn't been described in her original publications um, in this data because she just was not exhausted in that. Um, and number two is she was able to discover some new organophosphate esters uniquely because we scaled the search out to all public mass spectrometry data. And these organophosphate esters did not actually appear in her own data sets. So it's kind of, she was more comprehensive of her own data and we were more comprehensive because we could have used the totality of everybody's data and create a better catalog of putative organophosphate esters. So that was kind of one avenue that we think using all this public data could reveal uh, the full diversity of the chemistry or a more full picture of the diversity of chemistry that somebody may be looking for. And organophosphate esters is kind of one example, uh, one example of that. So the final pillar, again, we want to go through is reusability. How do we start sharing and reuse these queries that you might come up with? And so one thing that uh, we've created, just as a small thing, is called the MassQL Compendium. And so this is a curated list of MassQL queries that people can deposit saying, hey, these are the queries that I used in my own lab for this particular purpose. So whether looking for peptidic natural products, um, specific uh, features for, you know, if you're doing a semi-target or a semi-targeted like lipid, uh, looking for specific lipids in your assay, um, things like that, you can, pe uh, people have been depositing these um, and you don't have to write queries from scratch, right? You can borrow from others. Um, and we've also described a lot of the application of these queries in the supplemental information of a manuscript that uh, is currently under review. Um, and so not only is it good to be able to do, you know, run MassQL at GMPS2, you can also run it on the command line. But it kind of further is that we want to make it uh, more universal within the community. And so you can imagine, because it's a language, right? So it's the mass spectrometry query language. We want everybody to be speaking a similar language when you want to look for these patterns. And uh, what we've done is we've created a software to enable that. So we've created Python APIs and R APIs that are open source for people to use in their own software. And you can run it on the command line uh, on your own computers and as, as, as a workflow on your own computers if you would like. But however, to make it more user-friendly, we've integrated it into a lot of the uh, most popular uh, open source and some of the commercial tools out there. So one that you probably uh, more experienced now with is MZMind. So that's, it's being starting being supported in MZMind3. And so the dream is that you, you can imagine writing a MassQL query in GPS or GMPS2, applying it to your own data, that exact same query you can hand off to your collaborator or a friend in the field, and maybe they don't use GMPS, and that's okay. Um, they may use MZMind, and they can plop it into MZMind and apply it to their own data, and you can expect the exact same behavior. So it's kind of a portable way to do analysis that is, um, is consistent. And so we started supporting in things like MZMind, Unidec for, uh, this is actually for top-down data, uh, MS Dial, OpenMS. Well, again, these are really popular uh, metabolomics and mass spectrometry suites. We support it in GMPS and the GMPS dashboard, as well as Bruker now supports it in the 2023 version of Metabloscape. So we're, we're seeing some commercial uh, interest. Anyway, so we're very excited that uh, it's being adopted. So hopefully we can, we can realize our dream. 
Um, but also if you want to contribute or you just want to use it, definitely reach out and it's, it's kind of all open source and is, is out there. So in conclusion, um, kind of all of these points is that GMPS2 is a new platform um, that we want to get out into the community and build enhance resiliency and lower barriers for use of computational tools. Um, and in that similar vein, MAST and MASQL are new tools that help you mine your and public data, but specifically it helps lower the barrier to entry for people to start interacting with all this public data out there and democratize um, kind of the analysis. And also the way we've architected these things, you can run them at, at many different sites so it democratizes and creates resiliency uh, in those particular tools. And a lot of these things are available and in beta today. So definitely try it out and we, feel free to reach out um, to me and my lab, as well as anybody, everybody here sitting in front of you knows everything already. So I'm not even necessary as part of this equation. Um, but again, we wanna make tools useful and open um, and collaborative. So uh, definitely reach out. We love hearing from everybody. And if you, again, if you wanna contribute seriously, anybody can do it. Um, enthusiasm is the uh, is the, the the biggest thing uh, that that's necessary. So, and I just want to acknowledge kind of collaborators as well as my own you know my own little humble lab over at UC Riverside, as well as throughout the years, um, we've been very fortunate. Or I've been especially me. I've been very fortunate to have worked with um, hundreds of collaborators, and we've published good papers but, and hopefully impactful papers, but what's really fun is just the community that we've built um, that's been supportive. Um, and I'm, you know, it, uh, you know, very grateful, especially when I was a humble, you know, grad student, uh, people in the community took a chance to use my tools. And um, that has really, um, you know, I built a career out of it. So I got a job because of it. And so um, I'm, I'm really thankful, especially to a lot of the people um, kind of leading the summer school. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I definitely want to thank them as well as funding from the NIH, the US NIH, uh, the Joint Genome Institute, some gifts from Agilent Corporation um, and my startup at, uh, at UC Riverside. So happy to take any questions. I know I'm standing between you guys and you know beer and dinner. So uh, don't want to keep you all too long. Thank you for that great talk. I think we have time for questions. Microphone. So there's one in the chat here. Um, so uh, from Xinghui, uh, are you considering the function once you plot a masculine, or once you, I guess, you apply a masculine query, can you download the molecular network of the feature list of the compounds that have that specific fragment? So yeah. The, the answer is yes. Um, so one of the new things that we're all about integration, right? So, um, and being able to export and you can do whatever the heck you want um, in other tools. Um, and so one of the things that we can do in GMPS on the GMPS2 side, especially with MassQL, is we can start visualizing entire molecular networks in the browser, which is, you know, not the fanciest thing, but it is convenient. But we've also integrated that particular functionality with MassQL directly. And so earlier today, you guys created uh, molecular networks, um, but you have to download this inside Escape, which is you know a really powerful piece of software, but it doesn't really know about mass uh, mass spectrometry data. Um, and so we've enabled this in the browser, so you can apply MassQL on top of a molecular network, and then it'll highlight everything, and then you can download that table, and you can work with it, you know. If work with an Excel or anything like that, totally possible. So there's definitely reach out if you want to try try this. Happy, happy to show you all these things. One, you know, one of the things is this. One thing we're really bad at. Or we, well, one thing that maybe we'll frame it the other way. One thing that we're very excited about is working with individual collaborators and say, we have this sort of need, right? And then we we build kind of these features because it's fun to build tools that are actually being used and useful. Um, and we don't tell anybody about it. Um, 
we're all busy. And then, so just one particular anecdote is Alan, John, you, you don't met Alan. Um, whenever we were postdocs together at UCSD, there was a particular feature for creating histograms or something of molecular networks um, that I had implemented because I was having fun back in like 2015. You know, it's late at night. You're like, oh, it'd be fun to do this. And then like in 2019 or 2020, he's like, Ming, it would be great if we did this. I'm like, Alan, we did this. He's like, God damn it. I wasted so much time. Anyway, so it's probably good to ask first in case that we've already done instead of wasting time. But um, it's just, we do a pretty bad job of, of advertising everything you do or everything we can do in, in a lot of these platforms. So um, just kind of a, a small anecdote. Any other questions? Well, feel free to bother the people that are like, when you go out to dinner, to ask them questions. They know more than me about actually using these tools um, anyway. Um, and, but one of the things that we, I have been hosting, but I kind of stopped because baby's crying and things like that. But we're tr I'm transitioning out of paternity leave soon. Um, and uh, we, I host office hours every uh, Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, at Pacific time. But that's a great time to uh, email me or to, to stop by office hours on Zoom if you want to ask interactive questions. Um, sometimes my apologies, we get I get a ton of email, so I can't I don't always respond timely. But here is a kind of a dedicated time to answer questions uh, about our tools and, and, and things like that. Um, so and I'm trying to get some of my friends that are more experimentally minded to join me at these things so we can just at least hang out. Um, so hopefully it won't just be me um, and you'll get a broader panel of expertise, but we'll see, we'll see how that, that all goes. But anyway, thank you all for, uh, for, you know, sharing this time with me and definitely feel, feel, feel free to reach out um, and to collaborate or, you know, use the tools. Um, we'd love to get feedback. So if you use the tools, especially in beta, uh, happy to have you use it, but my like soft request, and I'm trying to guilt you all is you've got to tell us good, bad, or ugly. That's, 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 that's my, my, my ask of you guys. So anyway, thank you again to you all and the organizers for having me. Um, uh, I hope the rest of, uh, the, the summer school, um, is a success. So. Thank you, Ming. Hey, Ming, can we borrow two more minutes of your time? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take a nap right after this. So whatever, <laughs> I don't have a pressing, pressing meeting. There's so. a couple more questions in the chat. So you need a different account to log into GMPS2, right? Uh, yes. Yes. So, so it's a different, you? yeah, they're new. It's kind of, so, oh my God, it's a thing. It, so we're, we're not like, we are a very modest, so give you an idea. So I'm a big computer nerd. So I've been building like computer desktops for a long time um, since I was like, you know, 12 or 11. So I've always had a fascination with hardware. So we put together a very modest comp computational cluster in our server racks at Riverside. Um, but the thing is, uh, you know, it's we have a finite budget and you know, the, anyway, small anecdote, I've been buying used server equipment off of Reddit, which has been so much fun. But anyway, it's I'm, I'm pretty frugal guy. Um, so um, they're, they're rock solid, but the thing is we just don't have a huge budget like UCSD had for you know petabyte scale storage. So we don't wanna open it up to uh, just have a free for all. So we're slowly, you know, slowly uh, ramping up, giving out accounts and figuring out management of resources and things like that how much we can safely give you know, out for free. Um, so we're still figuring that out. But since you're at the summer school, uh, email me, happy to make you an account. We're still in the early phases. We have just you know a few hundred users right now. Um, so it's, it's very manageable. And we're upgrading the servers for new compute and storage um, and, and things like that. Uh, but you know we're, we're, we're trying to grow slowly so that we don't run up against a hard wall of and promise more than we can deliver. But you're at the summer school. Um, so, you know, kind of friend of a friend kind of thing. So uh, definitely reach out and we'll make, we can make you a new account. Um, hopefully it's easy to use, uh, but uh, you know, it's definitely a work in progress. 
Great, thanks, Ming. I think a couple questions for self result in chat. So communities are answering each other's questions, which is good. Um, I'm sure, what do we do now? Group work? <laughs> We're done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Ming actually is keeping us, actually I am now. So thanks again to Ming uh, for presenting. Okay, enjoy your sleep. Okay, take care, everyone.